Do you know what this worker did wrong? Whether you work in an office, manufacturing plant, warehouse, or a store, all employees need to be instructed on the proper procedures to limit their exposure from coming into contact with blood or other bodily fluids during an emergency situation. This training program is designed to inform and educate any and all employees who can be reasonably expected to have contact with blood or other bodily fluids in the performance of their work duties. You will be instructed on the proper procedures to protect yourself and to limit your exposure to bloodborne pathogens. In this training program, we will familiarize you with the contents of the OSHA standard, bloodborne diseases, preventing exposure, proper protective equipment, signs and labels associated with bloodborne pathogens, procedures to follow if exposed. Bloodborne pathogens, or BBP for short, are disease-causing organisms that are present in blood, other potentially infectious materials, OPIM, are any body fluids or unfixed tissue. <laughs> The relative risk of exposure to BBP is relatively small. However, the effects of an exposure can lead to deadly consequences. In 1991, because of serious concerns about these exposures, OSHA mandated the Regulation Standard 29 CFR 1910.1030. This standard was again updated in 2001 to incorporate new regulations from the Needlestick Safety and Prevention Act of 1999. OSHA defines blood-borne pathogens as disease-causing microorganisms found in human blood, as well as human blood components and products. In addition to the OSHA regulations, your employer should have developed an exposure control plan. This is a plan developed by your employer that addresses the requirements of the OSHA regulation. The exposure control plan should be reviewed annually and includes the following. A determination of each employee's potential exposure to BBP based on their job duties. Methods to limit or eliminate exposure and updates that reflect changes in technology that may further reduce or eliminate exposure. Procedures for investigation of exposure incidents. Documentation of the required annual update process, including non-managerial employee participation in the development and updating of the exposure control plan. Both the OSHA regulations and your employer's exposure control plan are to be made available to all employees. Contact your training instructor or your supervisor to review copies of them. There are many bloodborne diseases. We will focus on the three major viruses that cause the greatest threat. They are HIV AIDS, Hepatitis B, and Hepatitis C. HIV is the virus that leads to AIDS. It is estimated that 1.1 million individuals are living with this virus in the U.S. With one in five of them being undiagnosed, there is not a cure or a vaccine to combat this deadly virus. Symptoms at the onset of this disease vary, but include rapid weight loss, dry cough, recurring fever or profuse night sweats, profound and unexplained fatigue, swollen lymph glands in the armpits, groin, or neck, diarrhea that lasts for more than a week, white spots or unusual blemishes on the tongue or in the mouth, pneumonia, memory loss, depression, and other neurological disorders.
Hepatitis B is a virus that can lead to fatal liver failure. Current estimates show that about 1.2 million people in the U.S. are infected, with an additional 60,000 new cases each year. There is a vaccine available for hepatitis B. The vaccine consists of a three-dose injection that has been proven to be safe with a 95% effective rate at preventing the disease. Your employer, at no cost to the employee, should make this vaccine available, especially to employees who are at a high risk rate of exposure. This vaccination is so important that OSHA requires you to sign a release form if you decline the vaccination. This vaccination should be administered before any exposure should occur. However, an after-the-fact vaccination is available, but may not always prevent the disease. The common symptoms of hepatitis B include fatigue, abdominal pain, loss of appetite, nausea or vomiting, joint pain, jaundice, yellowing of skin. Hepatitis C is the leading cause for liver transplants and can lead to death. Current estimates show that around 4.1 million people in the U.S. are infected with an additional 26,000 new cases each year. About 80% of those infected show no symptoms, but they are similar to those of hepatitis B. Currently, there is no vaccine for hepatitis C. HIV AIDS, hepatitis B and C, and the many other viruses transferred within bloodborne pathogens do not always show symptoms immediately. They can even lay dormant for several years. These symptoms can be caused by other diseases as well. The only way to determine if you are infected is to see a healthcare professional and get checked out. This training program has limited its content to workplace exposure to bloodborne pathogens and will not address sexual transmissions. Therefore, occupational exposure to bloodborne pathogens enters the body through parenteral exposure. This is where pathogens enter the body through breaks in the skin or through mucous membranes. Most exposures occur through needle sticks, human bites, skin abrasions or cuts that come into contact with potentially infectious material. Infectious material can include blood or blood products, human tissue, vaginal secretions, any other bodily fluid with blood in it. One of the most important means of preventing exposure to bloodborne pathogens is to use the standard precautions rule. You treat all bodily fluids, with the exception of sweat, as if they are infectious. The types of proper protective equipment, or PPE, should be selected based on the types of exposure you are faced with. If contact with or splatter from potentially infectious materials is reasonably anticipated, the PPE should be worn on the areas of your body that are potentially exposed. It is especially important to cover mucous membranes, skin abrasions or cuts, and your hands. Proper protective equipment should include gloves, mouth and eye protection, gowns, aprons, lab coats, caps, shoe covers, resuscitation barriers, CPR masks. Disposable PPE should be properly discarded after use. Other forms of contaminated PPE may be reused after proper decontamination. Your employer is responsible, with no charge to the employee, to provide the proper protective equipment necessary for emergency situations. However, it is the employee's responsibility to wear it properly and maintain it in proper condition. 
It is also up to the employee to request any and all replacement items when PPE becomes damaged or unusable. Be sure to consult with your supervisor for the location of its PPE at your company. It's also important to remember that PPE does have limitations. It must be properly worn, maintained, and discarded and replaced if damaged. Engineering and work practice controls are mechanical devices and procedures that are designed to reduce the likelihood of an exposure incident set up by your employer. These controls have limitations as well and should be used in conjunction with other methods to prevent exposure. These work practice controls can vary from company to company but may include hand washing. Hand washing areas should be set up with proper antiseptic hand cleaner and paper towels. <laughs> Biohazard signs and labels and containers should be used to properly identify contaminated waste. Containers should be closable, constructed to contain all contents, and prevent leakage. They should also be properly labeled or color-coded and closed prior to removal to prevent spillage or protrusion of contents during handling. The proper color for biological contaminated waste is red or red-orange bags and fluorescent orange labeled containers. These containers need to be disposed of properly through your supervisor or an area hospital. Contaminated laundry must be handled as little as possible. It should be transported in appropriately labeled containers and must be properly cleaned. The Needle Stick Safety and Prevention Act requires the use of safer needles, needleless systems, and sharps disposal containers. Policies, procedures, and needle stick devices are required to be re-evaluated for effectiveness each year. Employees should never break, bend, recap, or remove needles. In addition to needles, any sharp object such as broken glass should only be picked up by mechanical means such as a broom and dustpan and should be disposed of properly. Activity in and around areas of possible bloodborne exposures needs to be limited. This includes no eating, drinking, smoking, application of cosmetics, or the handling of contact lenses in these potentially exposed areas. An exposure incident is when blood or other potentially infectious materials make contact with eyes, mouth, other mucous membranes, non-intact skin or open sore, or by piercing the skin. Stop and limit exposure to yourself and others. Immediately and thoroughly wash any exposed area of skin with antiseptic soap and water. Flush your eyes, nose, or mouth with water if blood or any body fluid comes into contact with these areas. Report the incident to your supervisor or appropriate management personnel. The area in which the incident occurred will need to be properly cleaned up. If this is not your responsibility, then be sure that the proper persons are notified of the area needed to be cleaned. Your company should provide the proper BBP cleanup materials. They may choose to use a low-cost BBP cleanup kit that provides all items necessary for the proper cleaning of an exposure incident, as well as properly protect the employees cleaning the area. The steps for cleanup are contain the spill using absorbent materials, remove used absorbent materials, disinfect the area with germicide or a 10% bleach solution, dispose of contaminated materials into properly marked containers, discard and decontaminate PPE. An incident report needs to be completed that describes the incident, including the routes of exposure, 
and the identity of the source individual if known. As a result of the exposure incident, you should have your blood tested for diseases. The test results should be discussed with you and appropriate treatment administered if needed. The source individual or individual's blood may also be collected and tested if consent is received. At this time you will have the opportunity